Good morning. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. O oh Lord, let our prayers be set forth in your sight as incense. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O oh, come, let us worship. O oh, God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make us perfect in every good work to do your will and work in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The proclamation of the word. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 36 to 43. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydia. So they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. So Peter returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him upstairs. They took him to an upstairs room. The room was filled with widows who were weeping and, and showing him the coats and other clothes that Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When, Peter saw, when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. And then he called in the widows and all the believers, and he presented her to them alive. The news spread through the whole town, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our next reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. <clears throat> Praise from the great crowd. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
Then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are those who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus claims to be the Son of God. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus said, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, St. Andrew. So good to be back with you all again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would speak to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And through these inspired scriptures, we invite you to comfort and challenge us so that we might practically apply what we learn in our daily lives. Amen. Today, we're looking at the seventh commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. God is anti-adultery. You shall not commit adultery, period. Very short commandment. We are commanded to honour our marriage partner. God commands us to sanctify sex because he values it so highly. It is a good gift from our gracious God. We're not to disdain it as something of little worth. From the very beginning of creation, to commit adultery was to violate the sanctity of sex in marriage. And the sanctity of sex in marriage clearly also calls for the sanctity of sex before marriage. Our culture, by contrast, is lying to us. Our culture clearly does not value sex. It thinks of it as a very common thing, so common that virtual strangers will share life's most intimate treasure. No matter what age we are, it's very hard to stand against the flood of cultural and peer pressure. God made our physical bodies, and in Jesus, he wore one himself. Despite what many might think, God is very pro-sex. After all, he invented it. He made our sex organs, and he gave us hormones. Humans are unique as a species in that relationship, not reproduction, lies at the heart of the sexual act. Because God created sex, he is in favour of it. It was part of his original purpose and not an afterthought. Genesis chapter 2 shows us that men and women were created for companionship. He brought them together. 
We are therefore, by God's design, sexual. Our sexuality, although twisted by our rebellion against God, is good and one of his gifts. But to say that God is pro-sex is not the same as saying that he is in favour of all sexual activity. The thrust of the seventh commandment, and the whole Bible, is that there is only one divinely approved context for sex, and that is inside the secure framework of a marriage comprised of one woman and one man. Faithful, monogamous, heterosexual, covenant marriage is God designed, and the only form of marriage that God recognises. And God designed sex for marriage. All research shows that couples who cohabit before marriage have a higher rate of divorce than those who do not. To put it bluntly, it seems that those who sleep around before marriage are likely to do so afterwards. Sex is incredibly powerful, both for good and bad, because sex is destructive if it is misused. God's gift of marriage provides the only safe place for sex. Sex is so much more than intercourse. Nowhere is a person more vulnerable than naked in bed. It requires confidence and loyalty and it takes time. Only within the secure confines of a covenant marriage relationship, where we are protected by security, love and commitment, can the power of sex be safely and wonderfully unleashed. That is why the Bible says that sex outside marriage is always to be seen as dangerous. There is no part of our existence where the lies are bigger, more widespread and more seductive than, than in the area of sex. We need to be honest and think hard in order to challenge today's sexual myths. Never ever say as you hear a scandal in the news, <laughs> it can't happen to me. Our sexuality is such a powerful force that it's capable of tripping up presidents, prime ministers, politicians, princesses and pastors. Very few moments of sexual gratification can lead to a lifetime of guilt. Just those few moments. And not just a lifetime of guilt, but a wrecked home and a shattered family. We need to see through the lies of our society and not be persuaded by the soft words. The media, your colleagues, peers and friends might call it a, a fling, a bit of a romp, a harmless bit of fun, an affair or even a romance. We should call it what it really is. Immorality, adultery, infidelity. A breaking of vows and commitment, lying to those closest to us, who trusted us with their very selves, their intimacy and their vulnerability. Remember that, just like all the other idols, sex promises what it cannot deliver. If you're a teenager, sex promises maturity and fulfilment. If you're lonely, sex promises intimacy and companionship. If you're bored, sex promises excitement. If you're hurt, sex promises comfort. If you're insecure, sex promises affirmation. But outside the context of marriage, it delivers none of these things. It only gives guilt, emptiness, and deeper hurts, coupled with regrets which are often experienced for years later. And we need to be aware that there is more to adultery than the physical act of sex, because marriage is founded on more than physical relations. 
Marriage is an all-embracing covenant arrangement where both parties commit themselves to each other for life and voluntarily give to each other everything they are, sexually, psychologically and socially. When viewed in this light, the horror of adultery becomes plain. We need constantly to remind ourselves of how serious, destructive and costly an act of adultery is. Adultery is terrible because it is a betrayal, not only of an oath, but also of a person. It's full of lies, deceit and cheating. This is why the innocent person's response is, how could you do this to me? That is the agony. Adultery smashes the deepest and most intimate levels of trust, shatters the covenant promises, and breaks down the walls of privacy and exclusivity that protect the heart of marriage. It is, in short, an abomination. Our society, by glamorising and celebrating the sex act, sex act at the expense of relationships, is paying a very high price for ignoring and riding roughshod over the Seventh Commandment. Being practical, if you are involved in an adulterous relationship, end it right now. Not tomorrow, not next week. Now, pick up the telephone and do it. There is no easy way out. And yes, someone is always going to get hurt. But the only way to end it is to end it. You need to take drastic action. Where there has been adultery, you and your marriage partner will probably need to see a Christian counsellor who is able to help you work through the issues of broken trust and violation. It is very delicate and painful, and it needs to be done with God's help in the context of repentance and forgiveness. These things, please hear me, are not unforgivable. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ can set you free. With our loving, caring God, the door for repentance is, is always open and the healing of a marriage with his help can happen. Whether you are single or married, you might be thinking, well, I've never actually committed adultery, so how does it relate to me? In Matthew chapter 5, 28, Jesus applied the seventh commandment to our thought lives. He said, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman, and we could say a man here, lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, with him in her heart. What Jesus was doing was shifting the emphasis from the action back to the desire. Clean hands are not enough. We need clean hearts. Jesus said that the look of a, a lust or desire is also adultery. He didn't say that the look is equally as bad as the physical act, but he did say that it still counts as adultery. I read about a man who had just committed adultery. I don't know what happened. The man protested in bewilderment to his minister. The minister turned to him and said, I do. Had you ever committed the act in your mind with this woman? Of course he had. And his actions had finally followed his thoughts. The battle for purity is fought in the mind. Jesus is not condemning the appreciation of pretty girls or handsome boys. It's not the first look. You can't help the first look. It's the second and the third looks. That's why Job wisely decided to make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Chapter 31, verse 1. Be careful with what you fill your minds. Pornography, books, magazines, movies, internet. Choose to avoid those lies and save your marriage. Or if you're single, your future marriage. 
Marriage is built on the foundation of mutual respect. The alternative is contempt. Where there is contempt, eventually there comes the dangerous statement made when looking longingly into the eyes of someone who is not your spouse. You know, I don't get this sort of respect at home. <laughs> From there to the bedroom is a short walk. If you're not yet married, never consider marrying anyone you do not thoroughly respect as a person, however good-looking, charming, rich or famous they may be. And never consider marrying someone who doesn't love Jesus as much as you do. One way to keep a marriage strong is to take responsibility. This means fixing the problem, not fixing the blame. Decide to make your marriage work. Both partners have to make a firm commitment to faithfulness, fidelity and honesty at all times. Tell yourself you are going to make it work or die trying. And reignite the romance. If there was more courting in marriage, there would be fewer marriages in court. To do this, we need God's help. And the great news is that God wants to help us. He loves us and is faithful, committed and covenanted to us. He didn't show us his love by sending us a romantic poem or by dropping a bunch of red roses onto our doorstep. He did it through cries of agony and excruciating pain. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us the only way to resist temptation to infidelity is to root our marriage or our singleness in the rich soil of God's confirming love it's only when we allow ourselves to be loved by Jesus that we are free to love like Jesus, faithfully, unconditionally, with purity and selflessness. When we choose to give all of ourselves, not for what we can gain, but for, for what the other person is worth, that is when we discover that the seventh commandment is for us and for our good. Take a moment to invite the Holy Spirit to cleanse your mind of any sexually impure thoughts and ask him to forgive you. Commit to your marriage or your singleness and commit it into the Father's hands and choose to trust him with all your relationships. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, even when we have not been faithful to you. When we have committed spiritual adultery by making people and things more important than being with you. Please forgive us and help us to keep you as our first and highest priority. Lord Jesus, you are the most attractive person who has ever lived. And yet, despite being tempted in every way, just as we are, you lived as a single man, a pure, holy and sinless life in thought, word and deed. We honour you for leading us by your example. And we ask you to help us to live likewise in wholesome singleness or faithful marriage. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that the battle for sexual purity is fought in our minds and imagination. Please would you cleanse us of impure thoughts and replace them with whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable, that we would think about such things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening. May the Father bless you all richly this week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the prayers of the people. In this Easter tide, we rejoice together at the resurrection of Christ, that the world may be commended to the care of the Good Shepherd. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For Christian churches throughout the world, that they may experience unity and may follow Christ their shepherd. Let us pray to the Lord. For the nations of the world, that they may turn from oppression, imperialism, and warfare, and seek only the welfare of their peoples. Let us pray to the Lord. For the homeless, the hungry, and the sick, especially all those whom we hold on our hearts, that they may find comfort in the one who shelters them with his holy presence and guides them to springs of living water and wipes away every tear from their eyes. Let us pray to the Lord for all mothers and those who give motherly care, that they may follow the example of the good shepherd who leads his children to good pasture. Let us pray to the Lord. In thanksgiving for the holy apostles, Barnabas and Paul, all the saints and martyrs, and especially let us give praise to the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now for our offerings, lifting them to God and asking him to bless the gifts that we give to him for the ministry of his church. Thank you for sending in your, your offering, your tithes, your alms. Thank you for your support of the ministries of this church, St. Andrew Anglican Church in Alliston, a place of God's love. Thank you. Let us now lift those gifts to God and ask a blessing. God of loving care, you spread before us the table of life. Give us the cup of salvation to drink and keep us always in the fold of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior and our shepherd. Amen. And the Lord's prayer. As our savior taught us, let us pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God and the blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors at St. Andrew in Alliston. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and within you and remain with you always. And not you only, but also all those you love, here and in the hereafter. Amen. Have a wonderful week. God bless you and keep you. Watch over and protect you. Amen. <laughs>